Well, we're in our Holy Week, bringing it to its conclusion. And I was reading only a few days ago, Good Friday, uh, the story of the crucifixion. And as I read it, I found four or five little words that I had never read very carefully. And perhaps you have the same experience. You just read it because it's there by force of habit until the Spirit checks you and you stand and look at that. I was reading in Matthew the story of the crucifixion. And I'll read you the verse. It's in uh, Matthew the 27th chapter and say the 34th verse. And they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall and when he had tasted thereof he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments casting lots that they might be filled up which would spoken of the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture did they cast lots fulfillment of the scripture in its prophecy. And sitting down, they watched him there. And sitting down, they watched him there. Seven little words, but so very significant. I had read that many, many times without thinking. What a crude, cruel, terrifying vision that they would ever want to sit down and look at. The Son of God in the act of crucifixion and death becoming a spectacle and sitting down they watched him now the question comes to me when I read that what do you see when you look well what you see when you look depends very much if not wholly upon what you bring to the vision the vision is one they all looked at the same objective spectacle the Son of God dying on Calvary. It was the same spectacle, but here was a group of people, and as I looked at it, I have taken seven different aspects, that is, seven different people who looked at him, and what did they see? Well, when you look, you carry with you, without thinking about it, your own peculiar personal reaction to that stimuli. The vision is a stimulant. It stimulates in you a whole background, perhaps a whole lifetime. And as you bring that lifetime up and expose it to that vision, something tremendous will happen. It has to happen. And what you see, I believe, is your reaction because you bring to it what you see. You have it already in your heart. You have it already in your heart. It's like great music. You go to, a, uh, to hear some good music. I'm a, a Christian and of course I'm Pentecostal and uh, supposed to be spiritually minded that God never took out from me my appreciation of beauty. I like beauty in music and in art in any field because God is a great artist and a creator of beauty and because he brings us out of darkness and sin into a life with him he does not bring any dissatisfaction in us concerning the things that are beautiful in him if we are Christians we will respond to that beauty I have known people who had very much sense of the beautiful until they were really converted and after they had come to God through Christ Jesus and have lived with him in the spirit, he has aroused in their consciousness a response to beauty that they have never sensed before because I believe that should be uh, a normal reaction. So when we behold, we carry with us the response, great music. We might have this morning some very fine concerto played. I like a piece of music like that. I, I, I think it's beautiful. Well, now, with there may be a dozen people, do you think every one of you people would get the same reaction? You couldn't. You say, yes, it's beautiful. Yes, it's beautiful. But what part stirred you? 
There had to be something in your heart and life which responds instantly to the tone or the color that that music is producing. And in a, in a moment, you're transported, you're changed, you're lifted, you're thrilled, you're carried out. Well, how? But the sound of the music striking in upon what you have brought to the music. How do I know? Because of a 500 reactions that come from 500 different people. Isn't that true? Do you think everyone enjoyed that music just as you did? No. Because they were not bringing what you did. I've seen some people say when the violins get in a piece of music. How many know sometimes the violins they have to be used to build up your, your background? And some people say, why is he fiddling so? Listen, how many of you know he's building up a remarkable background? A tremendous background. Now in a minute there's going to be a flash of color and on comes the crashing thing. You wouldn't get that unless you knew what he was doing. And the man stands there, I wish he wouldn't fiddle so when he's going to play a tune. How many of you know you don't get a Yankee Doodle played in the concerto? You get music. You get color. You bring to the music what you enjoy. This is purely the outward stimulant, and it stirs within you what you bring. You do it the same in art. I, I've visited the art gallery, perhaps you have too, in London, Tate's Gallery, where they have Turner's marvelous pictures in color. They are tremendous, Turner's colors. And one day he was standing there, rather than sell out, easy, and here were some people, and he said, well, I never saw colors like that. He stepped up with his side and he said, don't you wish you could? <laughs> well, I feel like that sometimes. The man let out such ignorance. It tried him, so he just stepped up and said, don't you wish you could? Yes. And sometimes when I'm reading the words that somebody is thrilled to pieces, I say, Lord, do something in me that I will respond to you. My whole heart will respond to God. He displays himself so many times. He gives us this marvelous word. I don't want to sit down and read it as though I was reading a story out of a magazine. It's life. It's life. His words are life. I want to read it so it quickens me. Now, teaching that thought in mind, they sat down and watched him. Who are the they? Well, when I looked at it, I said, I, I think there was quite a little group. And I think they're all going to get a different reaction as they sit down and watch him. The Son of God in the death throes, in the agony of Calvary, offering himself back to God as an offering for the sins of the world to redeem the very ones who are looking at him. So I, I started making a little list of these people. I don't know how far I'll get with them, but I want to talk about them this morning. I think the first group that I want to look at are these two terrifyingly wicked Jews, those Pharisees and the old priests and all that hierarchy that was always antagonistic. They were always against him. They had connived in every way possible to get a hold of him and pull him out of the way. While the common people heard him gladly, they were conniving him to put him out of the picture. These Pharisees, the priests, they were all present, or speaks of them. So there they sit. Well, what are they seeing? To them, to them, they think, I'm seeing the end of this troublemaker. He's been in our midst these years, stirring up this faction, doing everything against us, never coming to us, but out among the common people, preaching this gospel, and at last claiming to be the Son of God in all such blasphemy. It's time that he's put out of the way. And so they rejoice together. But do you see what it is? They are rejoicing in their own defeat. For the cross and Calvary forever defeated 
the antagonism of that group and silenced them. And they were looking at their own defeat because they brought their defeat in their hearts. Do you get it? They brought their defeat in their hearts. Exposing it before that Lamb of God, the whole thing was an expose. There it was. Their darkness, their hideous attitude toward him, their antagonism. And as they rejoiced, they had been shouting, crucify, crucify, crucify. Now they think, now we have crucified him. No, you Pharisees, you priests, you scribes, you're looking at your own defeat, for you brought defeat. And it's exposed to you through this glorious light, the Lamb of God, the light of the world, and it exposes it. And you are there sitting in your own defeat, for you shall never have the occasion again to antagonize it, to terrify it, to be ugly and kill him. This is your hour, which is an hour of defeat, for you brought it with you. Now we could talk some time concerning that first group. What did they see? They saw what they thought, the accomplishment of their conniving. Well, the very accomplishment of their conniving was the defeat that silenced them forever. For they having nothing, they have nothing more, nothing more. Silence. Why? That's what they brought to the cross. And they sat down and watched him. What did they see? They saw their whole moral national collapse. Now I want to talk about another group. Do you know anybody else that was there watching? If we take it from the two extremes, that of light and that of darkness, this seemed to be the darkest hour in the world but it was giving birth to the greatest, luminous, brightest, glorious hope that we shall ever have. It was having its birth, for all life is born out of death. And there is a principle that we'll have to own if you are a Christian making your way back again to the heart of God. Remember that in this strange and wonderful walk that we have in the Spirit, moving back again to the heart of God. There are principles and laws which we must understand and follow if we make any kind of success of it. Rather than some singing book theology, get a hold of the word of God. What does he say? All life issues out of death. There can be no life unless there be death as its foundation. For out of the secrets of that death, life will spring. I spoke about it the other night with a little apple seed. That little apple seed was potentially a tree full of fruit. But blind people can't see that. They see a seed. Look past that. Past this potential. It is a seed. But in the hands of God, that little brown seed is a terrific tree, green and fresh with leaves, laden with blossoms and with fruit all hidden away in a little brown seed. No farmer adds anything to the tree. He cultures the tree. He waters the tree. He takes care of the tree. And out from the midst of the seed, the tree grows. You don't add anything to the tree. No farmer went out and put leaves on it. The leaves are in the seed. No one went out and put limbs on the tree. The limbs are in the seed. Can you see that? That's the miracle of God in the vegetable world growing. A seed, a, a tiny miracle. For hidden away in that little seed are all the possibilities of the tree and the fruit. You do not add one thing. You release it. Let him come into your heart and release you. And set himself free in your heart. All you can do is say, come in, Jesus. I can be the ground. You are the everlasting seed. Plant yourself in my heart. Culture it, water it, fertilize it, prune it. Do all you can, but bring the blossoms and bring the fruit. For you are the secret. Potentially in you are all the things of the here in the hereafter. 
So we find life issues out of death. Who else is very present watching this whole scene but is not visible? Do you know the devil was there or didn't you know that? The devil was there watching what he thought was a marvelous success. I will at last put this man out of the world. He had tried it when he was a little baby. That was the devil who got him that idea of slaying those little children. The devil didn't even want him to live. He said, I can do something. I can get in here. And he tried his best to get rid of him, even as a little child. For he knew, he knew that that marvelous, wonderful Christ, born as a little babe, was the answer to the whole riddle of the universe and the answer to God. Hallelujah. But he is defeated. He tries again when he comes out grown and is laboring in his synagogue teaching and preaching. Gets a mob so they can push him over the precipice if possible and kill him. And Jesus moves through them like that and God takes him through and delivers him. He gets him out on the water in the ship and his disciples the devil is the prince of the power of the air. Gets his location. That's his habitat. His domain of power. He is the prince of the power of the air. And he can start a cyclone. Why? Because it is destructive. He has come to kill, to steal, to destroy. He cannot give life. Jesus says, I have come to give life. Glory to God. Glory to God. I have come to give life. This enemy has come with three ideas. To steal, to kill, to destroy. And if we had a morning here for an hour, we would open up what those three things are in relation to the human race. They're the basic disturbing things. So he says, I can stir up a storm and drown him. And he stirs up a most terrifying storm. Jesus is aware of it. How do I know? Because he is Adam, the last, the perfected Adam, who has power over the things of nature. For God gave that original Adam power. And Christ, as that original Adam, displays his power and rebukes the storm. If that is a storm God has started, Jesus would never rebuke his father's work. Jesus never rebukes his father's work. He can rebuke the work of the enemy. And he did. And the sea was calm. Now he says, I've tried all the way through to dispose of this strange, marvelous man. Now we have him on Calvary. But what does he do? Do you know what he's seeing? He is seeing his own defeat. Why? Because he is a defeated thing. How many get it, or don't you? What is he seeing? He is seeing the defeat of himself. And he knows it. Uh, in connection with that, uh, I'll put down another verse that you might like to, to use. It's in Colossians 2.15 if you're taking notes where it says on Calvary he disposes and exposes and demolishes all the works of evil. He says it distinctly that at Calvary all that work of the darkness and hell is defeated in Colossians. I'm glad we have that verse. I'm glad I have scripture for what I'm talking about. Lots of time we don't sit down and study it but it's all there. Now let me take a third, just as I move along. How many remember distinctly now separate individuals who are mentioned in this group watching him? How many of them really could sense that he is and must be some kind of a supernatural being to have gone through all that he has and now with the thunder crashing and the lightning and the whole storm, the whole hideous thing in his death, what, what do we find? A centurion, not a Christian, a centurion. Now he becomes a, a, a type to me.
how many can see these are all typical groups of people that are living today? Did you know we have the centurions around us today? Yes, we have. Do you know we have the scribes? Do you know we have the Pharisees? Certainly. We have every one of these dramatic characters living right around us all the time. And what is the centurion's reaction? He has sense enough to know this is no common thing. This is no earthly, earthbound spectacle. She must be a son of some god. You remember? That was his reaction, and he spoke it out. This is the son of a god. Now, he has no Old Testament revelation of God, but he knows there is a god. And so he says, this is none other than the son of God, to go through a thing like this. A response nearer to truth than those who had the scriptures in their hands. The old scribes and them with scriptures in their hand, and he, a centurion, gets a reaction that's past them because he can see through. There must be something sublime, mystical, spiritual in this thing. He must be a son of God. Oh, I can't go on with that, but that's a, a, a lo lovely theme. Now I want you to look at another one. This, this much we have looked at is, is rather on the earth side. How, how do I know there was something else? I know from the scripture. The scriptures. Back in the scriptures, when it speaks of Jesus and his coming and his revelation and his marvelous death, resurrection, and the glorious homecoming, it was a spectacle that the angels desired to look into. Do you remember that? The mystery, and it says the angels desired to look into this mystery. It was quite veiled to them. God never explained to all the angelic hosts what he was doing. But the angels knew all the time as they watched this man moving, coming, going. Had they not sung at his birth? Had not some of them ministered to him in the hour of temptation? Had they not come and strengthened him in the garden? They had ministered and ministered and it says it was a wonder, a mystery to the angels that they desire to look into it. So God draws the curtain back and he says, angelic host, here is the climax of that whole dramatic life. It was all unto this death that he may come in life back again to our home. And the angels in heaven beheld it. What a spectacle that all heaven, earth, the whole universe invited to look upon. And as it says in the, in the scriptures, the angels desire to look into, God says you may look. And the angelic hosts beheld this strange, mystical, uh, beyond word, episode, Son of God passing into death. Now, there's somebody else there also. We have the centurion, angels, while Jesus is dying on the cross, he is yet sensible enough to respond to them. This thief on the cross is smitten with conviction. And while one of them rails against the Lord, this thief rebukes his, his friend over there. Do you remember how he rebuked him? He told him to be quiet. He says, we have done evil and deserve, but this man has done nothing to deserve it. Wasn't that sweet to have that as a response from a thief, a testimony from a thief? One of the first testimonies we have of him hanging on the cross is from the lips of a thief. He takes testimony from anyone who will give it to him. The angels are filled with it. Heaven is sounding with it. It re-echoes even in the heart of a thief whose consciousness, his inner condition has been awakened. And he said, we deserve it, but not this man, for this man has done no evil. And he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me. Well, what did Jesus say? The only thing that a dying Savior could say, 
he accepted his repentance. This day shall thou be with me in paradise. There's the first convert from the crucifixion was made on a cross. The first, first convert, the first convert is a man hanging on a cross close to Jesus. I like that. So I have another one who sat, stood. No, he was hanging. But he also watched him. You get it? What is it? It's the repentant heart. The heart that is open and conscious of his desperate need making its confession and Jesus receiving him this day shall thou be with me in paradise first convert hanging on a cross isn't it strange well this whole thing is strange to me I don't think anybody in the world could ever made a story like this story of the crucifixion only God can make a thing like this the first convert from the death all of them were by anticipation they looked forward to Calvary forward to Calvary here is one in the immediate presence of Calvary and the very first one in the immediate presence of it after its long period of prophecy is a dying thief isn't that strange that that's who we are that's broken humanity making its confession and God says through his Christ this day shall thou be isn't it lovely he reads the heart when our lips can't always say what we want to I think some of the most meaningful prayers I have ever prayed were never prayed with my lips prayer goes past your lips prayer goes past your lips past that and that's what Jesus sees so we find the thief on the cross now let me look at another group some who are very close to him because they are mentioned here are the disciples at least some of them the very mother of Jesus herself and the other Mary the women or Magdalene what we, what we have the most intimate friends and his relatives the closest to him the very closest to him are present with him now as he hangs on the cross I want to speak of Mary just for a moment I don't think any of us could put our place, ourselves in the place and get the same reaction not one of us because we can't appreciate the heart of Mary we all know it from reading it. We've never experienced anything like that. Here was the mother to whom the angel had announced that I will, God will give you the Savior. You shall call him Emmanuel. So she has received that word, carried it in her heart, and it was under the shadow of his wings that the little Christ child is formed. It was not in the open, in some brilliant light place of explanation and analysis and all the logic in the world and the philosophy that would understand it. No, she said in amazement, how shall this thing be, seeing I know not a man? Her view was purely normal, natural, physical. I'm not married, how, how shall this thing be? That wasn't a question that she should have to have the incarnation explained to her don't be ridiculous and God said I will send an angel and he will sit down and explain the incarnation to you can you imagine anything as crazy and foolish as that don't let it enter your mind she's not asking for an analysis of this idea of his incarnation it was purely the amazement of a maiden in his quick response and saying oh God how can that be he answers her just as easily abide under the shadow of the almighty now do you see something there 
He never desired a brilliant analysis. Many of our scholars have so hard tried desperately for these ages to explain the mystery of the Incarnation. God never desired it. How shall it be? Abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The mystery is God. Where will it be wrought out? In the shadow, Mary. And it was only as Mary took that place of shadow, dependence, utter abandonment to God, that the Christ child is born. And she carries this little Christ child and finally gives birth to it. And this is her great joy, for she has brought forth at last what the angel had announced. And she brings him forth.